All righty. Welcome to Inside the Labyrinth Podcast. This is episode seven, season two. Uh, today's going to be a great day. A little mix up. My co-host Jay couldn't make it, so I had to bring in a big gun, and I'm going to kick it over to my, my my man Aaron. Aaron, what's up, man? How you doing? What's going on, man? How you doing? Pleasure to be here as always. Thanks, man. Really appreciate you coming in. Uh, that's huge fat loser on Instagram. Um, and episode six, episode six, we had Ricky and Dan. So uh, make sure you guys check that out. That will be released in a week. So now, um, no music. We're going straight into the labyrinth. I'm really excited. Uh, looked up to this guy for a while. Um, found him through Mark Bell, one of Mark Bell's podcasts. And when he was back in I think 2010, when I found Stan. So Stan Efforting, man, how you doing, man? Thanks for joining us. Great, man. Down here near Jackson, Mississippi, on our way to Birmingham, Alabama, as part of our 60 Cities in 60 Days Ops uh, seminar tour. So I just stopped at a park here, a nice, uh, beautiful park with a lake and everything, and it started sprinkling, so I popped back into the van to talk to you guys today. Oh, that, that's awesome. So we want to thank you for doing that, man. And that van looks nice, man. I couldn't tell if it was a little apartment or a van. <laughs> Yeah, now I had to have something with the refrigerator and freezer and microwave. I towed all my meals around with me everywhere. Ah, well, we're gonna hit that. We're gonna hit on that uh, a little later on for first responders because we got a few questions for you, man, on that. Um, but uh, before we do that, we want to jump inside your brain, yeah. inside your labyrinth, and kind of see how was high school for you. Um, did you play any sports? Um, how was it really just growing up in high school? What kind of high school kid were you? Yeah, you know, it was great. I played a lot of sports. My pops uh, let me play whatever I wanted. Mostly I, I played soccer and I wrestled. Those were the big ones for me that I did every year. Uh, I was a little kid. I was 98-pound wrestler as a freshman and sophomore. I weighed 106 as a junior and 115 as a senior. Wow. So I'd always, I'd always wanted to get jacked. And so I, I finally started <laughs> lifting weights in college. And it took me a long, long time to, to build up to where I'm at. So you picked up in college, what kind of, wow, that's, that's actually amazing to me, man. So what, what kind of training did you start with? Cause you know, you had your bodybuilding, your, your powerlifting careers. Did you kind of just, is there a, follow, a routine you follow? Cause when we had Ed Cohen on here, he used to get the magazines and follow Arnold and those type of routines. So I'm kind of interested in what kind of routines you just started with. And if any, and if you did have a mentor to teach you or kind of how do you start learning as a, as a young lifter? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I was 140 pounds as a freshman in college, and I went out and bought Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia Bodybuilding and started trying to do every exercise in that book. Um, I didn't have a mentor at the time. I was started taking some weightlifting classes at college and just learning how to use the equipment. Uh, the biggest thing I learned from all that, I obviously wasn't strong at 140 pounds, and so I just thought that if I lifted heavier weights, I would get bigger. And so I kept trying to get stronger and stronger. And I didn't realize till many years later that those are uh, somewhat different pursuits. Uh, plus, I didn't eat enough. I was in the gym training two hours a day, six days a week. I used to think that you built muscle in the gym. I didn't realize that all you did in the gym was break down muscle. And so uh, I was training too much and eating too little. I didn't make much progress. And uh, after two years of training, my first bodybuilding show, I competed at 158 pounds. I looked like a coat hanger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how was that? How did that go? And now, so you're a junior uh, in college at the time or a sophomore? So what are you, like 20 years old at your first show? Oh, I was 1986. And so I was, uh, yeah. I was just about 20, 19 years old at the time. And I, the promoter of the show, uh, you know, I was really well conditioned and he, uh, he thought maybe I had some potential. He owned a gym. And that was the first time I had somebody that actually explained to me that I needed to flip the script, needed to train a little bit less and eat a little bit more. And I would start to get better results. And so, in fact, I started implementing that uh, and definitely started gain, gaining weight year after year thereafter. I still never learned that heavy weights don't necessarily build muscle any better than, uh, you know, a good hypertrophy program and certainly much worse, to be honest with you. So that took many, many years to figure that out. And you, and that was in, uh, did you grow up in Oregon? 
I did. Yep, that was in Oregon. I was born and raised in Portland, and then I went to school at the University of Oregon, is where I was in college, in Eugene, Oregon. Oh, the Ducks. It's very nice. So, first bodybuilding show off the books, how'd it go? You know, I split the pack. There was like 20 guys. I think I took 10th, and uh, I was fine with that. I kind of, bodybuilding's all about, uh, you know, just trying to beat your last performance and it's kind of like hooks you at that point it, it gets to be addictive and so now you're you're just trying to to get better and place higher and uh, from that very moment I started lifting weights I'm looking at the magazines I always thought it would be great to be a pro bodybuilder I just didn't realize how long and how hard that would be yeah I was going to ask you if you got hooked into bodybuilding obviously you just answered that um, and a lot of people I feel like either you get hooked or if you don't do well, like you came in 10th, like you said, might just put it aside. Meanwhile, and me and Aaron were just having this conversation before you came in about if you're new to something and how much time it really takes, as, as you know, like you're not going to see the results you want in a month. And that's where a lot of people start falling off the wagon or, you know, they, they're they not even off the training wheels yet, you know? And, and I know you're a big believer on uh, just staying the course day by day. And uh, putting in, getting the meals in one one meal at a time, or one set at a time. Yeah, I've always been, you know, kind of a blue collar guy. I've always worked a lot of different jobs where it's just a matter of putting in the time. And I'm a bit OCD. I I repeat a lot of the same behaviors every day. And I I tend to, uh, you know, to be really anal about stuff. And so I, I kind of, it worked for me. I, I like tracking everything. And uh, so I was tracking my meals and I was tracking my workouts and I was, uh, you know, tracking my sleep. And uh, so all of that was, it was a perfect sport for me. It kept me really preoccupied. I always had a goal, you know, the next carrot was uh, the next bodybuilding show uh, and you'd, uh, just keep banging away. I was never really discouraged by, uh, you know, where I was at or where I was headed because uh, it was just, I could go to the gym every single day and do something about it. That was the big thing. And that's mm. still today when I go to these seminars and I work, I just try and set up a structure of consistent, repeatable behaviors that yield uh, the highest return and get them to, to do those things. I have a little checklist and I make them send me their app and the pictures of their meals and their daily weight, uh, check their workouts and uh, try and build a progression into it so that they're getting stronger and, uh, throughout the workout and getting bigger and better. It's always been a long-term pursuit for me. It's never a, you know, a three month deal to me. It's, it's, uh, it's always been a longer three, four five year window, a lifestyle, if you may. Exactly. And you built that. I like that. The routine. I wonder how many books you have up Stan from when you were 19 wrote in a notebook of all the meals you had and the logs and you probably have a library full, but, uh, you, it was a good that you implemented that and then you kind of, that just became your lifestyle. Like you didn't even have to think twice, right? To write it, log your meals or log your workouts or anything. It was just an instant reaction to after you finish a set or a rep or something like that. Yeah, it was all mapped out. Everything was scheduled. I ate every three hours. I knew exactly what I was going to eat. I prepared ahead of time to make sure it was there. I knew exactly when I was going to train, what I was going to train. So that was all you know, pretty easy. It was all scheduled. And that's, I think, you know, something that I try and design for all of my clients is to try and set up a, a schedule first and foremost that they can comply with so that they can get the results that they want. Yeah, scheduling is really important. I mean, even like for me too, I mean, obviously I'm not you or anything, but like uh, I've lost 160 pounds and put on muscle within the last couple of years. And like, scheduling and like maintaining a steady schedule has been something I preach to everybody because like, even if your schedule gets messed up a little, like you can still kind of like fall back on it. Like as long as you, it helps you maintain your discipline too. Like even if shit goes wrong. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Aaron has a crazy journey Stan, and he, he, uh, he's in really good shape now, but, uh, Aaron, what was your starting goal at when you started? Uh, when I first started losing weight, weight. I was 425 pounds. And what are you now? Wow. Yeah, I'm down to 265 now. 
Yeah. It's great. It's, it's incredible. Nice. And you have to feel great too. The best part oh about it is you start to feel amazing. You have more energy. I feel feel so amazing i used to get par- i tell this to people all the time i used to get parking tickets all the time because i was too lazy and i was just double park and like park illegally now like on my meal break at work i go take an hour walk just to you know just to walk around and get some more exercise you know i it feels great it, i mean people don't realize how good it is for your mental health and your physical health to uh lose weight and start exercising and get a routine and all this stuff Everything yep. seems so out of control sometimes. It's good to have a lot of things you can't control, and you can always control what you put in your body and how you use it. Agreed. And I think that, uh, I mean, obviously walking is incredible. I've, I've talked so much about how important the 10-minute walk is. I think the biggest people make is they set themselves up for failure by creating a diet plan that's over-restrictive or it's foods they don't want to eat. Uh, it's not something that they can sustain. And the same thing is true with their exercise. They think they got to go out and jog five miles a day, when in fact the research suggests that uh, more exercise does not equal more weight loss. And something as simple as a few brief walks a day uh, is great for, for digestion and health and blood sugar control. And you don't really burn calories to uh, allow you to eat uh, with exercise. You just stay active throughout the day, and then you just don't eat like an asshole, and you try and design a... <laughs> A diet program that you can that you can sustain it's what I like about the what I'm doing with the vertical diet is that I'm giving people foods that they really want to eat and uh, and then it's not something that they go on and off it's something that they actually are consistently using I always hear people say I'm going back on the vertical diet because that's what they enjoy that's what they made made them feel good they're able to eat, uh, you know, lean steak every day. They're able to have a whole egg or two. They're able to have yogurt. They're able to eat a potato and they're able to have fruits and they're able to salt their meals. And all of those things is, is what normal people do. Uh, and the typical dieter's diet is actually over restrictive and causes them a loss of energy. It increases their hunger. Things like egg whites and tilapia and broccoli and you know, quinoa, all the stuff that bloats them and makes them feel terrible and trying to avoid red meat and trying to avoid fruit and trying to avoid dairy and trying to avoid salt are all the things you shouldn't do. So we've really been misled in, in the dieting industry by these uh, guru diets uh, and it's caused people a lot of problems. So uh, I just want people to know that are trying to lose weight, that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's much easier to do it if you can create a lifestyle out of it. You don't have to suffer through this process. Oh, big time. 100%. I couldn't agree with you more. Like legit, like nobody should be restricting their diets or their food intake to the level where they feel like they're suffering consistently. It's just, yeah. The way. And even worse than that, a lot of those restrictions actually make them uh, worse off uh, when they eat egg whites and don't eat the yolk then particularly with women, they lose, they don't have the biotin. So their skin, hair, and nails gets adversely affected and it dries out. Mm-hmm. For men, that's, that, that doesn't get any choline. And choline is protective of the liver. It can uh, reverse and prevent fatty liver disease. When people eat chicken breast, they don't realize that there's three times as much iron, six times as much B12, and nine times as much zinc in a lean piece of red meat. So it's actually an inferior choice. Plus, chicken breast is much higher in polyunsaturated fats. Those are monogastric animals that eat corn their whole life, and they end up with a 17 or 25 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, whereas red meat, those are, those are uh, ruminant animals that ferment cellulose fiber, so they end up with like a 3 to 1 or a 6 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And then, uh, of course, not having an iodine source in your diet causes hypothyroidism, uh, so these women end up with hair loss. Uh, we talked about red meat importance of iron. A lot of women end up with uh, anemia and uh, ultimately with the female triad, which includes uh, amenorrhea, which is cessation of the menstrual period, uh, and osteoporosis because they're told not to eat dairy. And that's the most highly absorbable, bioavailable form of calcium. And it's more important than just bones. It's for nerve signaling and it's for muscle contraction. So all the things and then salting the food as well and putting fruit in there increases body temperature and metabolism converts thyroid and the liver from T4 to T3. All of those things give people more energy and it uh, prevents them from being as hungry. 
So, you know, the, the diet has to satisfy those requirements because the reason people fail uh, on diets is because they get hungry and tired. And so you have to address that. Like a, a stress eating, basically, right? Or fatigue eating? Is that what you do? Pretty what much. You call it, man, right? Yeah. yeah. You get hungry and you get tired and you're going to start binging. And dieting would be pretty easy if you, if you weren't hungry and tired. And so I, I try and create a diet plan that actually gives people energy and makes them enjoy going to do their exercise or their workouts. I prefer lifting, obviously, to retain lean body mass. Uh, but I want them to have energy throughout the day. And that, that way it's sustainable. It's a lifestyle and that they can eat like that all the time. And it's not just goal oriented. It's something I'm going to do for a short period of time. I'm going to suffer all the consequences and then end up going off the diet. Six out of seven people who go on a diet lose weight. 95% of them gain it back. And it's because they get hungry and tired and they don't style uh, and don't manage the logistics of the whole thing. Like we talked about earlier, just in terms of, of proper planning. Uh, so you can, you can execute the diet plan. Yeah. And I like how you use that word suffering Stan, because <laughs> being in a, in like a, being an AA and Alcoholics Anonymous, like, and the statistics are almost as similar. It's crazy because like one, uh, in the first four years, about 90%, 90% of people will relapse and like, you know, from drinking or drugs, which is really crazy. And it takes like, it takes a person to get it right in the first 90 days, 3.5 rehabs. And it comes down to structure and your mindset on, if you already are thinking you're suffering as in your diet, are you diet, like, are you getting sober for you? Or are you getting sober for someone else? Are you diet, dieting in quotes for you? Or are you dieting for someone else? And if you already start to diet and you feel like in your mind that you're suffering, well, then you're suffering and it's never going to work. So, you know, and I've, I've seen your video twice now and I think it's a gold. It's one of the best videos I've ever seen. I don't understand why not everyone in this world has watched it yet. It's when you're at Thor's gym and you give the huge seminar on everything. Um, it, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. And you really break break it down to an Aaron's the same way on the facts and the truth. And just because a diet or something worked for someone else, it might not work for you. Cause you don't, you don't ask yeah. one client, you don't ask one client for the body image. You ask everybody for it because it's going to react differently. Like for me, I have colitis. So I know what kind of foods are going to cause me to blow and I have stomach issues. So you probably would, or someone that comes to you with Crohn's or colitis or proctitis, you would already know what kind of foods hopefully, is going to affect that person and you're not going to give it to them. It's like, all right, same thing with an alcoholic. You're not going to just give them a beer. You know what I mean? Right. No, that's why I start with a low FODMAP diet because 60 to 80% of uh, uh, people who go on a low FODMAP diet experience a, uh, a, a decrease in those symptoms from digestive disorders, IBD, IBS, Crohn's, you know, even the autoimmune disorders like uh, something like asthma. Uh, those things, the symptoms actually get better uh, in the, on those kinds of diets. So, and I always say that I don't eat foods I like. I eat foods that like me, and I make that decision about an hour after I eat. If I'm all gassy and bloated and I've got diarrhea, then that's probably something that I shouldn't be eating consistently. And so that's where I start with my diet. I, my, the whole vertical diet is, uh, at its core, it's a low FODMAP diet, and it's a high micronutrient-dense diet using highly bioavailable foods like we just talked about with respect to the whole eggs and the red meat uh, as, the, as the basis of the diet so that people uh, have all the micronutrients necessary to stay healthy and have energy. Now that's a lot more important. You know, if it fits your macros, doesn't necessarily provide adequate micronutrients. And so what happens over time is that people start to manifest these, uh, uh, these problems. And then they just can't stay on the diet if that's, you know, if that's the way that the, that the diet's they're responding to the diet. Yeah. Bio lane, right? Lane Norton. And that's the thing. It's like what you like the, you talk about micronutrients. Well, you have an Oreo for carbs, right? And fat. Then you have yeah. an apple. The apple is going to have way more micronutrients than the Oreo or the two Oreos or just for an example, you know? Um, but talking about the standing, I want to, I want to hit on that. And Aaron can agree with me on this is, Especially, and I'm trying to remember the number, Stan, about if you stand an hour, uh, 10 minutes every hour for the whole year, it's like running 26 mile, uh, 26 marathons or something like that, or 24 marathons. Yeah, there was an, uh, an article that looked at just the calorie consumption benefit of standing over sitting uh, and even preferably, you know, moving around. 
uh, it, it's pretty significant. We call that non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's uh, your activity level. Um, you know, you have your basal metabolic rate where you burn calories just at rest. Uh, then you have your, your um, uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's just you moving around throughout the day, just cooking food, maybe house cleaning, uh, even things like blinking. Uh, those things are affected by, uh, uh, by how active you are. And those, that'll slow down when you diet. Everybody kind of tends to move a little less. And so it's also one of the most um, significant controllable factors in metabolic adaptation. A sedentary individual, uh, as compared to an active individual, the difference between the two in terms of non-exercise activity thermogenesis might be as much as 2,000 calories. So that's why I like uh, making sure people have adequate energy. If you're not getting iodine in your diet and you have a low thyroid, it has a much greater effect on your non-exercise activity thermogenesis than it does on your basal metabolic rate. You're just more tired, so you sit more uh, and you don't burn as many calories every day. So that's the major uh, controllable factor in, in, uh, in metabolic adaptation that I focus on a lot. Taking walks, staying on your feet, those kinds of things. Yeah, I wanted to relate that to sitting in a patrol car. Like if you're sitting in a, in a especially you'd be in a first, uh, being a cop, and you have the gun belt, you have all this on you stand. First of all, you, I love how you say sitting is a disease, but all that pressure and everything on your back. But when you're just sitting there, um, one, what I'm trying to say to Aaron, is like you get out of the car, you walk around the car, it's safety. You're able to see a lot more. You're not a sitting duck. Um, I think if a lot more cops got out of their car when um, they weren't just depending on what command or what precinct you're in, if you're busy or not, or have some free time, instead of just sitting there and looking at your phone or just really slouching over with the gun belt, you know, it's a terrible seated position. So if we can get you as a first responder or a cop to go out there and walk around a little more. Um, and like you say, three, 10 minute walks a day, if it's three, 10 minute walks during your shift in the eight hours or something, um, your energy levels and probably your awareness levels will probably increase too. Right, Stan? Well, a whole host of things. And I have that video, 10 things that uh, uh, 10 minute walks change your life. Um, it's important to recognize that, that it's more than just the activity of moving around. It's how it affects blood sugars. It dramatically improves uh, blood sugars, twice as effective as taking metformin, which is the number one prescribed drug in the world for controlling diabetes or preventing type two diabetes. Taking three 10 minute walks a day is twice as effective as taking that drug. Um, it improves digestion. It increases enzymatic action and muscular control. You digest better. You don't get as much gas and bloating. Uh, and it isn't necessarily cardio per se. It's also sustainable. The idea that you could sit in your car all day and then at the end of the day go to the gym and walk on the treadmill for 30 or 40 minutes, that's not only not terribly effective, because more exercise does not equal more fat loss. That's been studied extensively. It's, uh, it's, it's not enjoyable and it's not sustainable. I'm driving all over the country in an RV. I'm hitting 60 cities in 60 days. We're driving from three to six hours every single day. And I stop at the Flying J uh, to gas up quite often, which is a truck stop uh, throughout the country. And what I see is a lot of truck drivers, most of them overweight, significantly so, sitting in their trucks or walking into the building and sitting down and eating a hot dog, uh, or worse yet, smoking. And I, uh, I start to, to fuel up my truck, and then I start walking around the parking lot in circles. And I'm the only person doing it. And that's frustrating to me because uh, those three 10 minute walks a day could be life changing for these people. A modest adjustment on their total calorie intake, of course. And I get a lot of uh, police, fire and ambulance, real estate agents, uh, firefighters, etc., who talk about not being able to comply with their diets because they're in the car all day and what have you. And that's why I introduced the thermos to them. And I don't make any money saying this, but getting a little 24 ounce thermos off of Amazon for $20 solves when you leave in the morning and you're eating breakfast, you're also prepping two more meals. They'll stay hot for 14 hours in that thermos. So now you're eating when you want, what you want, that's within your uh, calorie allotment and it's the healthy food that you prepared yourself. You're not getting it from a fast food place. And it's just sitting there in your bag uh, or in the trunk of your car I take them on airplanes with me. If I fly overseas, I'll take three or four of them to get me the whole trip. Uh, so that would be a huge 
uh, benefit for people to be able to manage uh, what they're eating and when and how much because they'd have pre they'd have meal prepped and then can take that thermos around with them and that food stays hot. Um, I've used a thermal pen and measured it over 160 degrees after 10 hours if you put it in really hot into the thermos. And that's how I manage. I, I use on this trip, I'm in an RV. And so I have a fridge and freezer full of my meal prep. I'm eating my monster mash and my breakfast scrambles. But that's all the food that I want. It's low FODMAP food. There's no vegetables in it or no vegetables. There's no vegetable oils in it. Uh, I, I know what exactly what I'm eating. It's bison and potato and scrambled eggs and steak uh, every single day. It's got bone broth in it. And so uh, I, I haven't missed a, a step on this trip. I'm making sure I get in every night and, and I've got at least seven hours that I can sleep. Uh, so I'm, I'm sleeping well. I'm eating uh, in accordance with a, a, the same diet plan I've always eaten. I'm taking my 10 minute walks every day and about every other day at these gyms we're presenting at will knock out a workout. And so I'm able to do that even on the road as a, as a truck driver would do and maintain a very high level of fitness that way. Yeah, I think with cops, for some reason, we just have this mentality that we're like stuck in this patrol car and we can't get out. We can't do anything. We don't have time to do things. And it's just a lot of illusion. Like we unfortunately get this mindset that we're almost like victims of the job in a certain amount of way where we have to not be healthy and we have to like smoke and we have to drink and we have to do all this unhealthy shit because they're all like bad coping mechanisms and we can't prep our food and you know because we're always stuck in this car but it's not true i mean i've prepped my food for years i still prep my food every single day i take it on the train and i take it on the subway in a cooler and it's yeah it can be cumbersome sometimes but the risk i mean the, it's worth the reward of being in control of my own body and being in control of what goes in it yeah take the thermos you don't have to eat cold food you'll have hot food all day Plus, yeah. I don't think they appreciate how much more effective three 10-minute walks is than trying to get in a 40-minute treadmill session at the end of the day. Yeah, I train bodybuilders and physique figure and bikini people all the way up to the, the, the Olympia level. Third place, Miss Olympia, Nadia Wyatt. Second place, Arnold Classic. She hasn't done cardio in the traditional in the entire year that I've worked with her. She's done three 10-minute walks a day. And just by controlling her diet, which is 99% of, of the weight loss in this for weight loss, not the exercise, People the 10 minute walks is, is different than exercise. It's again, insulin sensitivity is important, digestion to round a little bit. So if they appreciated that the three 10 minute walks was superior to uh, more enjoyable, more sustainable than the cardio, they would probably opt not to ever do cardio again in their lives, nor would they need to, uh, and just lift weights as they enjoy a few times a week, take three 10 minute walks a day after uh, at least three meals daily. And that could be after breakfast and dinner. So they only need to get one in during the day after one of their lunches and pack your thermos problem solved. That's all the logistics have now been resolved. Absolutely. It's funny. I go to, uh, I go to Bev Francis powerhouse by me. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, Been there. Yeah. And, and it's like, there's professionals everywhere. And I tell people this all the time. I'm like, listen, if you don't want to take my word about doing excessive cardio, that you don't need to. Like I go to this gym and I see professionals every single day and I never see somebody sprinting on the treadmill and they're in the best shape of anybody that I know, you know, like it, it is what it is. Yeah. My cardio mainly has this whole time has consisted of walking short walk, or like longer walks because I personally just enjoy walking. I enjoy seeing things. And then biking. Uh, and I'm not talking like high intensity biking. I don't have like a road bike or anything. I just like to get out and absolutely ride a bike. And when I tell people they like look at me like I got two heads, I don't really any cardio so because it's not really a necessity. Resistance training, weightlifting, and diet is like 99% of it. Yeah, and it's enjoyable and sustainable. And if you want to get your heart rate up, then just get under a squat rack and do 12 reps with 70% of your one rep max and see what happens to your heart rate. And at least yeah, then no, you're I... getting some at least you're getting some return on your investment. You're actually building muscle, you know, so as opposed to running around doing a bunch of cardio which actually wastes muscle. So uh, I much prefer to do lifting 
I can get all the cardiovascular benefit I need from that. And then just take the 10 minute walks for all the other benefits. Correct. Now, since we're on that subject, Stan, I'm kind of interested to see what you're going to say about this. Cause we've had, um, uh, a few like uh, we had Josh Bryan on from Jailhouse Strong, and we talk about PHA training and different type of training for a first responder. Because um, Aaron likes to say, some people like to make up a lot of excuses that they don't have enough time for a 45 minute session workout. If you had, let's say, um, a cop or a fireman, and they can only train three times a week for 45 minutes, what kind of breakdown would you give them to get the most effective work now for their job and their lifestyle um, for like a 45 minute session? Because I think there's a lot of people out there that think that they can't get a lot of work done, even in 30 minutes. I know you've, I've heard you talk about all the, uh, the amount of work you can get done in 30 minutes. Um, what would you recommend, for yeah. a, uh, especially coming out of COVID, haven't worked out in a while? Um, and again, I think cops, I just a big believer in strongman training because practice what you preach. Um, it's just so, it's like a mirror on the field, dragging things, picking things up, kind of, you need to have a little conditioning to, because, you know, when you put someone in handcuffs, it could be 10 seconds, it could be two minutes, and that two minutes is going to feel like two hours. So I'm a big believer on uh, uh, HIT, HIT training. Um, so I just want, can't wait to hear what you, what you have to say. Yeah, there's been periods throughout my career when I've been too busy to get in the volume of work that I would like to do. But the minimum effective volume, and this has been measured in science pretty uh, extensively, if you just did five reps, I'm sorry, five sets per body part per week, you could maintain and possibly even gain on that. So let's say, for instance, you could only train twice a week. What you would do is do your full body in that workout and you superset antagonistic body parts. So you would go in and you would do uh, maybe a set of uh, dips, rest a minute, do a set of chin-ups, rest a minute, do a set of dips, rest a minute, do a set of chin-ups, and you do that five times. Now you get five sets of chest, you get five sets of back. The dips also works the triceps, the chin-ups also work the biceps. Uh, you're done with that. Um, and you've gotten five sets in, which is the, what we consider to be the minimum effective volume. Also, you've provided adequate rest between each set of dips, uh, such that it, it's a good hypertrophy stimulus. If you do a set of dips and then 30 seconds later try and do another set of dips, then usually lactate buildup and oxygen debt becomes the limiting factor and not mechanical tension. So it's not an ideal stimulus to try and blast through a body part by shortening the rest periods lower than 90 seconds. You just get weaker and weaker, but it, it's not the muscles that are actually uh, uh, the problem. It's, uh, it's the lactate and the oxygen debt. So that would be your upper body workout then. And now you want to go over and do maybe the squats and five sets of hamstring curls and uh, superset those as well. Or, you know, do them opposite. Do a set of squats a minute later. You can go do a set of hamstring curls a minute later and run through that five times. I've just described about a 20-minute workout that you could do twice a week that you could absolutely maintain all your lean body mass and probably gain on. This has been studied extensively. Uh, uh, Greg Knuckles has talked about this on Mass Research Review. Uh, it's perfectly adequate. I've used that program when I've been really busy, and that was all I could do. Fortunately, I had some equipment in my garage, so 20 minutes twice a week. I, I never lost a step. It's twice as easy to maintain. It's twice as hard to gain, half as hard to maintain. It doesn't take very much, but it does take consistency. It does tr take training each body part twice a week, getting that minimum of five sets, the intensity needs to be within a rep or two of fit, and the rest period should be adequate to optimize hypertrophy. So that would be an example of an extremely uh, busy schedule and a time-saving program that anybody could use. We'll get awesome results. Uh, you know, in addition to setting ourselves up for failure with these over-restricted diets and, and, and excessive cardio, sometimes we also uh, create the expectations for ourselves that we need to do more than we need to do. Uh, and then it, it becomes unsustainable because you have the obligations of life with your work and your family and everything else. So I set up a program based on the individual's ability to comply first. Compliance is the science. And I designed it around their schedule. Everybody wants to know what the perfect split is. And the perfect split is the one you can follow. 
And then, you know, the guidelines for optimal hypertrophy are, as we just um, discussed, training every body part twice a week, getting about uh, five sets a week minimum. Typically in the eight to 12 rep range is, is, the, is the one that's most optimal. Although heavy sets of five and lighter sets of 20 provide the same hypertrophy benefit, but they create a little more fatigue as well. And so we use the eight to 12 range as optimal. Uh, and then the intensity level, get within a rep or two of failure. If you do 10 reps and you could have done 20, you're not gonna get a stimulus from that. So that's kind of the, the main components of optimizing your hypertrophy program uh, with the minimal effective volume. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate that, Stan. Um, I guess um, like a, a sprint, um, a type of conditioning, because not everyone's gonna have access to a yoke to farmer carries, to sandbags, um, a firm believer for me, not only to help my conditioning, but to help my mental aspect at the end of a workout, picking up a 250 pound sandbag 200, and, you know, carrying it back and forth for distance and trying to picture myself if I'm out on the street or doing something, you know, I'm a big believer on, on the vision game. Um, what's your take on sprints? Like uh, I've, I've read and heard a lot of things on three to five, hundred yard sprints is all you need. Uh, just for conditioning and uh, for fat burn and just to really help your oxygen level? Um, or would you break it down for 20, you know, like 10, 20s, 10, 30s, 10, 40, something like that? Again, as a first responder, you don't have to run three to four or five miles as a cop because you're not going to chase someone for three to four or five miles. I feel like, you know, 100 yards, 200 yards might be the max, you know, have, depending where you are in the city, if you're in an urban area, if there's a lot of fences, you know. So I'm, I'm a big believer on practice on what you're going to play in the game. So now you're talking about something that's sports specific, and in this case, career specific, the ability to perform a particular duty. Uh, and one of the things about sprinting is I don't think people realize how dynamic it is, that decelerating force of the, the foot hitting the ground and decelerating the body uh, has very high uh, uh, eccentric load that can uh, definitely be injurious to a lot of people that just kind of go out and think they can still do what they were, what they did when they were a kid. Uh, so you have to gradually work up into sprinting. I pepper that process with some stair sprints so that uh, because they're lower impact, it's all concentric loading. It's push, push, push with none of the decelerating uh, load from landing uh, and resisting the force of your body. Uh, that kind of helps me, um, you know, transition them slowly into sprinting longer distance and, and going faster. Um, but absolutely, it's just a matter of practice. And then how many sets of reps you do. Really, to me, it kind of depends on, um, it kind of be like if you're lifting weights and you're doing bench press, if if you keep doing more and more sets and you do fewer and fewer reps, at some point you're just getting weaker or your form starts to compromise. When I work with athletes, high school, collegiate, professional, like ball players, football, etc., I'm timing their sprints. And when they get significantly slower or their technique starts to, to really come apart, then I'm done for the day. Or uh, recovery rate. Uh, their heart rate getting back to normal. We can measure that oftentimes with that. Uh, that tells me they're done for the day. And so I do about as much as my body will allow me and then slow that over time to create that, that uh, peak level of fitness over time. But I, less is more. We're not digging holes. We're building mountains. And all you need is a little stimulus. Uh, you're breaking down a lot of muscle and potentially um, uh, exposing yourself to injury with those dynamic movements and so i just people are going to have to be uh, they're going to have to be smart you have to train smarter on those train smarter not harder right listen to your body listen to your body don't try to have an ego and think you need to post this picture on instagram or you, you <laughs> like a little girl or bitch because you didn't lift today um and i've learned that definitely over um what am i i'm 28 now but you know 23, yeah. uh, you know, just a few years ago, thinking I had to go into the gym and pull 500 pounds, which is 90% of my max every other week. You know, it's not going to get me anywhere. It's going to make me feel like shit later on, you know, and that's what a lot of yeah. 
people need to realize that like, it doesn't matter how much you put on the bench right now. You know what I mean? Well, and you also have to appreciate that everything you do has some sort of uh, fatigue component, and you you have a, a a systemic load, and it all contributes to that. There's only so much you can do, um, and so if you're sprinting on Monday and then you go in and lift heavy weights on Tuesday, all of that contributes to your system, and you might start actually overtraining as a result. Sprinting is very very uh, uh, dynamic it has a, a huge load component it's very draining that's why i might with uh with those folks i might have them only sprint once a week and then run stairs once or twice a week uh, because they'll recover better they'll have less systemic load and they might have to back off of their um some of their weightlifting as well you have limited physical capital that you can uh, you can only train so hard and recover from so much and just because sprinting is different than weightlifting doesn't mean that they don't both contribute to that same bucket of capital that you're, you're, uh, that, you know, that you can um, expend that energy and recover from. So uh, it's really important to kind of gauge if you're not getting stronger or faster or able to do a, a couple more reps or five more pounds or one more sprint or if your heart rate recovery is, is, not, uh, is not coming down fast then you might be overtraining that should progress over time you should get better and it's the same mindset people who think that they suffer the most think that they're getting the most progress or going to uh, perform the best and it's simply not true right yeah definitely can raise my right hand right so <laughs> my I'll, uh, you know i've definitely You've been, been there, there. At, oh yeah as in Heavy squat day. Now, tomorrow, I need to hit my sprints and do these things and feel my hamstrings rip out of my legs to know that, all right, I got to work in today, but it took me a long time to realize that's not how it is. And I think a lot of people um, will, and I think also feeling guilty also comes into a, uh, that. And that's a whole different type of psychoanalyst, you know, why you're feeling guilty about that. Um, yeah. I have a list here that I wanted to ask you because especially as cops and first responders, we're really going over your labyrinth. We're, we started on how your life was in the beginning. And we, once we started talking about the 10 minute walks, it just, the rhino yeah, started right. coming full speed in the labyrinth. That's He's right. Around that labyrinth now. So I like it. Um, I, I thought of a lot of quick foods that cops and first responders like to eat on the go stand. Um, and something that if it makes the list or doesn't make the list, um, because I know a lot of people and Aaron can say the same thing is they don't meal prep. They just don't do it. They did an excuse. They don't have enough time. It's too much money. Um, I'll do it for a Monday and it only lasts me to Wednesday and I can't do it again Wednesday night to Sunday and all blah, blah, blah. So um, protein powder, a shake to go, uh, any specific protein powder, whey protein, cut it out. It makes you bloated. What's, what do you, whey, what, protein powder and a protein bar because I see that a lot. Yeah, I don't eat either. I haven't eaten either for over 10 years. I haven't had a single protein shake or protein <laughs> bar. I didn't take any of those things when I uh, earned my pro card training with Flex Wheeler, and I didn't take any of those things when I set my world records in powerlifting. Uh, they're convenient, and they taste good. I don't think they're bad for you. They're certainly not optimal as compared to food. They don't provide any of the micronutrients. Um, I just You might augment an inferior uh, meal with one, or you might um, just be unable to get a meal and use it as a substitute, but even then, it's inferior. I'm a big fan. I would I would use supplements sparingly maybe post-workout or um, maybe like you said you have a shake when you're in the car I'd much prefer when I was making breakfast to make a, a the scrambled a few eggs and have a little uh, ground bison patty and pour a little bone broth and some white rice in there and stir up a mash and put it into my thermos and that's my uh, protein shake or my protein bar I've got it sitting right there handy it's hot it's uh, you know it's got far more uh, nutritional value. It's going to support any training that you're doing much better. They've done research and they've taken egg whites against whole eggs uh, and equated for protein and found that the whole egg users, this was on men over 50 weightlifting, they, uh, they had significantly better hypertrophy results and, and uh, something like, I don't know, it was like 70% better strength results. So the micronutrients matter. I want to make sure that people are getting whole foods frequently throughout the day. Um, if you're getting less than 20 grams of protein, like with a bar or something, you're not stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So you're definitely going to want to get at least 20 grams of protein. 
uh, for a man, I would, I would optimally try and get 40 grams of protein in that meal. You could certainly do that with a shake, but now you're missing out on the iron, the B12, the biotin, the zinc, the calcium. You're not getting any of that. And a supplement is not the same. Those cofactors in food that when they, uh, they maintain a much better homeostasis and contribute better to hypertrophy, that's been studied as well. I just much prefer that people, um, you know, don't uh, dummy down to the most convenient thing and try and think, well, how can I make the best thing more convenient? Right. Yeah. Amen on that. Um, the uh, when you hit up, but talking about the eggs, um, talking about like a bacon, like going to a deli, right, in the morning or for lunch, bacon, egg, and cheese, and if you're at a deli, turkey, lettuce, blah, blah, blah. What, what's your take on like a, a bacon, egg and cheese on a, on a roll, a whole wheat roll? I know you're against bread. I'm against uh, that kind of grain, but just uh, I'm talking for the majority of the population here. If they were going to get a bacon, egg and cheese from a bagel spot, what, what's a better alternative and a better alternative for lunch, turkey um, and just turkey on a spinach wrap or something and, and try to help the cops out there on what's a better, op- op- what's a better alternative to choose from. Yeah, I don't like any of those choices. And you mentioned earlier about it costs too much money to prep meals. It costs a whole lot more money to go to a restaurant and buy right. a bacon, oh. egg, and turkey sandwich than uh, whatever tip you leave the, the, the waitress. Um, I'm still, you know, much, would much prefer they made their own meal and brought it with a uh, brought it with them with a thermos. If I'm going to eat food out, uh, I'm chasing mainly proteins, particularly if somebody needs to lose weight. If that's their goal, is to is to cut body fat. Uh, they can eat about all the protein they want, uh, and that would be maybe the chicken breast or maybe the turkey. Um, I obviously prefer red meat. It's harder to get those good choices because uh, most restaurants don't cook them very well. Um, the big thing, and I don't, you know, I don't think bread's bad for you, but I do think it can bloat you, and it's certainly not optimal for performance as compared to getting a daily potato, which is high in potassium, or uh, oranges, which are also high in potassium, and also the uh, stimulate. Um, you know, the conversion of T4 to T3, like I mentioned, and increased body temperature. Those things just provide more nutritional value and make you feel better. Uh, They'll satisfy your, they'll satiate your hunger better, a potato and an orange, if you can get those. Uh, They're two of the most highest satiety foods uh, on the index when they measure that to see how long you stay full on particular foods that you eat. So I prefer to get those. Not a big fan of processed meats, but I don't think it's a huge deal. Um, uh, Yeah, those are tough choices. Uh, none of the, the choices you gave me were very good. They're not good at all. <laughs> if I'm in an airport, if I'm in an airport in a pinch, I'll go someplace to, and I'll just get some burger patties or maybe a chicken breast, or if I have to order something and just take the bun off, I'll do that. Um, and again, it's just because I don't feel good eating bread. Uh, it's high in polyunsaturates. It's uh, the grains uh, can be hard to digest for some people. I, it doesn't feel good on me. I, my movements aren't as good. My energy levels aren't as good. I end up getting brain fog and. I don't, I don't like that. I, I like to, I like the way good food makes me feel. I like feeling the way I feel and I'll do anything to maintain this. And I know as soon as I, I'd rather s- skip a meal, I hate saying this, it's certainly not ideal for young athletes where calories are king. Uh, but for me, in terms of how I'm going to feel, boy, I'd rather uh, just wait until I could get a decent meal. So as we wrap that whole up, it's cook your food at home, uh, red, red meat, bison lean beef lamb um chicken right if if you have to that's the chicken second to red meat oh 100 percent. it's like fifth to red meat to be honest with you it's uh, far inferior salmon should be what twice a week if you can right stan two servings of five ounces of salmon twice a week gives you all the epa and dha that you need it's far superior than taking fish oil or krill oil i, I don't know why people supplement those things when, Again, a micronutrient-dense whole food is available that'll give them all those benefits. And besides, take if somebody has elevated total and LDL cholesterol and they go to their doctor and their doctor tells them, uh, who's an MD, by the way, not a nutritionist, tells them to stop eating meat and whole eggs, first of all, they're wrong. And second of all, the alternatives are worse. And those fish oils don't really reduce cholesterol that much anyhow. And there's no evidence in randomized controlled trials that it, it improves uh, cardiac or for all causes of mortality long term, the better solution for decreasing cholesterol uh, is to get more sleep, possibly a CPAP. Uh, if you've got some degree of apnea, 
would be huge. And then to optimize thyroid function and take the 10 minute walks, uh, because that will dramatically reduce cholesterol walks by keeping the area under the curve for blood sugar and for insulin release, uh, that will prevent sugars from being converted to triglycerides in the liver, which creates the problem in the first place. So I, I just, I get frustrated when people get advice that they are something that they can take, uh, something that uh, can be done to them or for them and won't take the initiative uh, to do something for themselves uh, and prevent the problem in the first place rather than trying to manage it uh, after the fact, which uh, is usually highly ineffective and certainly by the time you get to medications comes with a whole lot of side effects. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because I'm a big believer because I've lived just, I've, I've been there, um, if, especially with mental health and mental health issues of, oh, you're a little depressed. Let's take this SSRI. Here, let's take this Zola. But wait, let's backtrack. How's your nutrition? Do you work out? Do you get any 10-minute walks a day? Let's see who do you hang out with. Let's go, instead of just feeding the, the candy pills, let's try to uh, attack how your lifestyle is first. I guarantee you a lot of people will see a increase of less anxiety, less depression, more hopefully um, feeling overall content in life and happiness. And as you know, uh, people don't really realize that food is a huge part of how you feel and with your depression, and anxiety, if you suffer from that. Um, so I just really wanted to get that out there that um, I'm happy you brought that up. No, that's important. And, you know, on that same, a huge contributor to this depression, uh, people who end up needing antidepressants is digestion. Uh, and the most important component of that is going to be um, uh, people who are taking antacids. Those people have a much higher uh, uh, susceptibility to suffering from depression and then needing antidepressants because the, the antacids lower the stomach acid. So now you're not breaking down proteins. You're not digesting and absorbing uh, minerals, uh, magnesium, calcium, iron effectively. And I see it very commonly. I've had people in my seminars approach me when I mentioned it afterwards and tell me that's exactly the path they went down. Right. Antacids, you need to get off antacids. They were meant to be used temporarily for extreme conditions of, uh, say, esophageal uh, burning, uh, just to let that heal. And then you got to get off of them. I have pressure quick fix kit. I have a high blood sugar quick fix kit in the vertical diet. And, and I have um, getting off of antacids, a, a quick fix kit for that, where I list the kits that you need to do to get off of those. Uh, antacids, people don't realize. Uh, that most of, of gastric reflux comes from low acid, not high acid. And taking those antacids can cause them more problems. And so we, um, you know, generally speaking, we'll uh, get them to eat their proteins first and carbs afterwards. We'll have them eat smaller meals. We'll have them use a low FODMAP diet that we've discussed, the low gas diet. Um, we'll definitely have them optimize their thyroid function. Getting adequate sodium uh, in the, or salt in the diet, the sodium chloride, important for digestion as well. You might drink a little less water with meals. We'll take the 10 minute walk immediately following a meal. All of those things will dramatically improve uh, their digestion. They can eliminate the antacids and then uh, they'll be able to eliminate the antidepressant medication as well in most cases. It's crazy that you mentioned that about the antacids because before I started losing weight and before I started eating right, like I used to have indigestion all the time to where I was taking antacids like on a consistent basis and also Andy. <laughs> at the same point like I was overweight I wasn't working out I was a miserable asshole all this shit all combined and then I started dieting and taking care of myself and now I haven't taken an antacid at all in years so it all falls in I think that's I, I never heard that before but it's 100 percent true and I'm definitely like a clinical case study in that for sure <laughs> I don't think people realize how bad they are they're selling yeah. them over the counter at Walgreens and stuff. People get on the prescription medications or even worse, but popping Tums after a meal is a problem. It will absolutely impede breakdown of protein, mineral absorption, and will then eventually lead to micronutrient deficiencies. And ultimately for a lot of people uh, will cause uh, depression and then they'll be getting antidepressant medication. It's, they go hand in hand. I've seen it. See, here's the thing. I know I'm just some meat neck bodybuilder, but, I've been, I've been completely and 100% committed to, to gaining weight and losing weight for over 35 years in a competitive level. 
studied exercise science at the University of Oregon. I used to scroll through microfiche in the science library up till midnight. Uh, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of clients over the year, uh, high school collegiate and professional players. You guys are familiar with all the people I've worked with. Um, I've uh, been coached by some great coaches. I've worked with over probably 20 different medical doctors over the years. I've had over 150 blood tests over the years. Uh, and I know those are anecdotes and testimonials, but I've received in excess of 50,000 DMs in the last two years, specific to questions about the vertical diets and all of these things we've discussed. And I've responded to over 90% of them. I spend a three, three hours a day probably responding to these people. And I see the types of questions that they ask, the types of problems that are most prevalent. And when I send them uh, a response and I attach an article about uh, whether it's acid reflux or whether it's blood pressure or blood sugar control, uh, and I get feedback from them in a very short period of time, three days to three weeks in most cases, and they realize significant improvements, uh, then I'm really confident, uh, plus the fact that my co-author is a registered dietitian with a PhD in exercise phys, uh, that the, the recommendations that I'm making are not only science-based, but they're extremely effective. So uh, I just think it's important to know that, that this this uh, vertical diet that I wrote up is over 220 pages with over 200 references to peer-reviewed published research and articles and videos to better help people learn more about uh, their specific concern. And it covers sleep, digestion, hydration, hormones, those quick fix kits I mentioned. It, it's more comprehensive than just diet alone. All of these things matter. And so I just want folks to know that, that you know, when I get on these interviews, I talk about Kind of in you know in a um, in a reader's digest form uh, that I, I just want them to do a little more research to ask a few more questions to get a second opinion uh, possibly read the book and look at the references that I recommend uh, and and I think they can most people can change their lives in very short order and the important thing to know about that is you don't need a six pack to get healthy. Let's see if I lost you there. Do I got you back? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, you don't need a six pack to get healthy. A 300 pound person, assuming that, that, that their BMI is elevated and they're uh, overweight or obese, if they lose 7% of their body weight, which is 20 pounds, they're gonna realize a significant improvement in blood pressure and blood sugars. A 10% loss in body weight will reduce 95% of any fatty liver problems as tested with biopsies of the liver. So a very small, uh, you know, to me, I consider it small. I'm able to get 20, 30 pounds off of a 300 pound person in 60 days, pretty consistent. It's not hard. Yeah. Initially, especially, you get significant weight loss. And just the goal is, is to make sure that you don't make them hungry and tired in the meantime, and they have no problem staying on it. I, I make my clients send me every single morning, their body weight, their hours of sleep, pictures of every meal they eat during the day. They just snap a picture and send it to me. I have an app that allows it to be time and date stamped. So I can see exactly what they're eating. We have a record of it. Uh, their 10 minute walks. Uh, those are all things that they submit to me regularly and they get extraordinary results. It's just, it's, it's so simple that it's so hard for people that it's the same thing every single day, hopefully. And you're just doing the same thing every day. That's all you're asking people to do. And you'll see the results. You're not asking for anything crazy. You're really not asking for anything crazy, you know? And for a cop, you though, get on. for a cop, we work, let's yeah, say I work four to 12. I work out before I go to work. I'll have the same meals, hopefully every day. And at the same time, um, and that's it. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going crazy here or what, but like, it's just, and Aaron could say, once you get into it though, that routine, Stan, it just, like you said in the, in the beginning when you started listening, it just becomes a lifestyle of something that why would you want to go back to that old life? Why would you want to feel a little depressed? Why would you want to feel this? You can actually see and feel life. Like you can, your, your perception even gets better. Like you can feel more agile and out there, you know, especially as a cop, it's crazy. Kind of yeah. You hit on a few really important things there. One is you said it was simple and it is absolutely simple. This is not complicated, but it's not easy for some people. Um, uh, mainly because it's about changing behavior and that creating the new habits. We mentioned earlier that most people, when they go on a diet, uh, lose weight, but they gain it back. A lot of people go on the wrong diet. They end up over restricting and doing it and, and thinking they need to do a whole ton of cardio. 
they get hungry and they get tired and it's just not easy to comply. So that's important. It is simple. Compliance is the science. Uh, build a diet program that's, uh, uh, that's effective. Um, I kind of lost track there. I was trying to think of what else you mentioned there that I was going to hit on that was really important. But uh, uh, yeah, I kind of went off. Either way, I think that's, that's the basis of it. Oh, you mentioned that uh, you do the same thing every day. And I do get some people that are complaining, like, I don't, I don't yeah. like eating the same thing every day. That's been studied as well. And it's, you know, food reward. Uh, when people try and eat things they're hungry for, they tend to eat more of it. And when people eat this, pretty much the same thing every day, when they settle in on some meals that they enjoy, they, they get more satiated. They tend to eat less of it in the long right. term. Like you said, so that you important. enjoyed like that they enjoy. yeah. they don't have to follow this this uh meal plan that they wrote out it's like i don't like tuna or i don't like this type of chicken or whatever beef then you can find out what you enjoy because then you're suffering and that's i like this podcast is you're suffering for no reason when you don't have to you know yeah, what I mean? food reward that's is uh when you get hungry and you open the fridge and then at that moment try and decide what you're hungry you're going to eat what you're hungry for you tend to eat much more of it if you have meals prepared and you already know what you're going to eat uh, then you're much more likely to eat less of it and comply. Same is true as when you get in your car and you're hungry and you drive down the street and there's a Subway and a Carl's Jr. and the Burger King and you're trying to decide what to eat. The fact of the matter is, is you're going to pick what you're hungry for and then you're going to overeat that food. Oh, so that's, that's what we call food reward. And that, that's a bad place to be. That's why meal prep is the number one behavior that dictates success. The National Weight Control Registry has been studying this for 10 years on over 10,000 people who have lost over 66 pounds and kept it off for over five years. And oh, wow. the number one behavior that uh, helps with compliance is meal prep. Whether you prep or you use you know, a meal prep company, it doesn't matter. But as we started, it's, it's meal prepping. It's having pre-portioned, packaged. Uh, maybe you make it yourself in Tupperware. Of course, I, uh, I prefer the thermos. But whatever it takes so that you know what you're going to eat, and it's been prepared, whether you do it on Sunday for the next two days, or you get up in the morning like I do, and I make three breakfasts, and I eat one, and the other two go in thermos, good till dinner. Yeah, I see a lot of correlation here, Stan, with the drinking part, alcohol part, and the eating part, as in, you know, I've been sober now nine months, and I didn't drink every day, but when I drank on my off days, I like to party hard. So these past nine months have not been easy. It's been very hard. But um, they say about once you get past that 90 days, it's like a big mark psychologically, you're not, um, you're not really, you're not addicted to it anymore. You're not thinking about it. Most people don't think about it as much. It's just that choice. Now, if I've been sober nine months, I just hit, it's my choice to pick up that drink. But I know, like you said, if you're going to eat like crap and that's there for me, it's the same thing with drinking. If I have a beer, I know it's not going to be one beer. It's going to be, I mean, Frank the tank old school is coming out. That's me, baby. I'm, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be right. good, but, um, I see a lot of correlation with that, the same mindset. And after I just uh, stopped drinking, um, not only with my mental health, but the next day I'm not feeling like another cheat meal or waste day. I'm able to eat. And with the stomach issue, it's just a huge, I don't think people really realize what two, three or four drinks can do to the inside of them, you know, over a night period. Um, and I know you're going to say drinking to me is like rat poison um and don't get me wrong i would love to have a drink but it's hard every day is a battle for me and the yeah. same thing with food addictions but um it does a lot to the body which people don't really understand you know they really don't get it and why do they have anxiety why do they wake up in the morning and their heart is pounding well there's the answer right there um, I know you're going to say no to alcohol yeah. and that's it. We don't have to go get deep into that. You could probably give a million reasons why, but. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I just can't claim to understand. I got a degree in psychology and I went to my professor, uh, my, my counselor and asked about doing an MSW, a master's in social work. And she asked me why. And I said, I wanted to counsel people. My mother, uh, her entire life suffered from alcoholism. Um, and pain, and pain medication, and then eventually uh, psychiatric medication, and has been in and out of mental institutions and suicidal behavior for uh, more than the last 15 years. Uh, I've never been able to find a solution to that. She's got addictive behaviors. Uh, and just like our good buddy, Chris Bell, who, uh, you know, whose brother passed uh, his addictions, and then Chris suffered from addictions. Uh, People who have addictive, type A people who have addictive behaviors, 
you've got to try and pattern them towards the kinds of behaviors that will preoccupy them that aren't bad for them. And that's where weightlifting has really, I think, I may or may not. Um, I'm a type A person. I'm, I'm on a 60 city and 60 day tour. You know, who would do that? So, yeah, man. But yeah, yeah it, it's for me, that's probably a whole lot more beneficial than snorting lines of Coke every day. I, so, <laughs> but uh, I would say so. The fact of the matter is really be the my addiction, right now. My oh, addiction yeah. was weightlifting. Uh, I, I told you that I'm OCD. I measure everything, every rep, every set, every meal, every hour of sleep. So yeah, that's probably an addiction, but uh, I would much rather someone pour themselves into uh, fitness and uh, weight training than to have those other habits that uh, are, are adverse for your health. So I don't have a solution for alcoholism, but I, I've just found, you know, I've got Bobby Summers with me on this trip and he's a 13 year Iraqi uh, uh, army veteran who, who fought in the Iraqi war, was injured, was blown up twice, suffered from brain injuries, came home with PS PTSD, uh, suicidal behavior, drug addiction. Uh, and then he found FitOps Foundation, which is uh, who I partnered with. And the FitOps Foundation trains these, these high risk uh, uh, suicidal behavior veterans that are addicts. They train them to become fitness professionals. They spend three weeks studying uh, everything about uh, nutrition and training and get uh, certification to get into that industry, to have a career in the business. And they pour themselves into that. And it saved a lot of veterans. It saved Bobby. He's on this trip with me um, and he's doing very well. He's lost nine pounds in the last 10 days. Uh, we're doing 10 minute walks. We're lifting weights. We're eating my bison mash uh, with potatoes every day. Uh, and he just feels incredible. Uh, he's had a lot of firsts. The first time he hasn't been um, vaping or, or whatever he calls it, uh, uh, using some form of marijuana or oils to help to get him to sleep at night. He hasn't had that on this trip in the last 10 days. Uh, a lot of things have, have changed for him because his health has improved. His weight has gone down. We've, uh, you know, done the 10 minute walks. I'm sure we're managing his blood sugars and digestion. He hasn't been gassy or bloated or had diarrhea. And all of that seems to be dramatically improving his mental health. And he's, he talks to his wife every day and She's like, you're different. What are you doing? You're, you're so calm. And, and he's, he's just saying, you know, I'm, I'm sleeping now. And I'm, you know, we're taking these walks and I've been eating healthy. And I don't have stomach issues anymore. And, you know, the vagus nerve connects the brain to the stomach. And a lot of that is a two-way street. And so, uh, you know, I'm not making any claims about diagnosing him or his medication needs uh, for his brain injuries and the like. But I just know that symptoms of, of damn near everything uh, seem to, to decrease in severity when you're managing things like sleep and hydration, nutrition, and, and, and exercise. And so that's all I'm focused on. And if his doctors feel as though he's made a significant improvement in his mental health, then they'll adjust his medication accordingly. And that's, I think that's going to be one of the great things about this trip is, uh, uh, is, uh, is having Bobby realize uh, himself how, how much you can benefit from these simple, again, simple uh, but, but not easy. You got to be consistent and create habits and a lifestyle. Uh, but I don't think I've suggested anything during this, this, uh, this discussion that seems overwhelming. It's probably, I think everything I talk about is really uh, seems uh, less complicated or difficult than what people presume to think that they needed to do to, to lose the weight or get healthy. Yeah, for sure. A, a choice, a choice A or choice B. What do you want? Um, yeah. And the work, what you just explained about uh, your partner that tell him thanks for his service, but also it keeps you grounded. When someone comes and they're all anxious and stuff, I like to say, look down, look at your feet. That's where you are right now. You're nowhere else. And that for a second takes them out of their own mind. And that's what fitness really does. It takes you out. And that's why I just wanted to start this weightlifting has saved my life. It saves Aaron's life. Um, and it made us yes. the people we are today. And Stan, it's, you know, if you didn't have weightlifting, I don't know. Maybe you can agree. Who knows where you would be? So um, I agree. I want to thank you so much, Stan, for coming on the show, uh, coming on the podcast and really uh, taking your time out of your crazy schedule. Um, again, uh, my name is Frank. You can find me at reps underscore four underscore responders. Aaron, what do you got for us? Uh, thank you. Really nice meeting you. Great conversation. I appreciate everything. You can find me on Instagram at huge fat loser. And uh, hopefully I see you at Bev's one of these days. You know, let me know when you're up in New York. Oh, of course. Yeah. We're trying to, to close location in New York uh, here shortly. So um, everything I have is at Stan Efforting. My Instagram is at Stan Efforting. 
my uh, website is at is uh, staneferding.com. On my website, I have uh, uh, the seminar tour. Uh, there's a button you can press, and it's going to show every city and uh, date and time and uh, the location. Some of them are still to be announced. We haven't closed all the locations yet, but uh, we're just getting started. We're 10 cities in. We got 50 left. We're going to be all up through the Northeast and then uh, all over the whole country. A major city in all 48 states plus Washington, D.C. So if anybody sees this and wants to join us for a, an in-person seminar that's free and anybody can attend, uh, go to stanefforting.com and click on it and pre-register and we'll see you there. Oh, that's awesome, man. Thanks. There's one in New York I saw, right? In September, maybe? Yep. Or somewhere that's around correct. there? That's correct. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's the first week of August right in there. August. Okay. All right, yeah. man. Well, thank you. Be safe. And uh, thanks for everything you do, man. Thanks for being a, a great leader and, and a great person, man. Look up to you. And Thanks for having me, brother. Spot. Good talking to you guys. You too, man. All right, Aaron. See you, buddy. Later.